Hi, my name is Jonathan Standing. I'm a freelance concept artist and illustrator. Um, I live and work just outside Toronto in uh, Canada, although you can probably tell from my voice that I did not grow up here. Um, I'm from the northwest of England, um, but you might not be able to tell that from my voice either because I don't sound like I'm from the northwest. Anyway, moving swiftly on. Um, this is a uh, tutorial to answer the question, uh, can you tell me how to paint an immense underwater monster? Well, I am most certainly going to try. Uh, the image that you're looking at here is a watercolour thumbnail. It's about two inches by three quarters of an inch. Um, it's really, really tiny and I work in watercolour when I'm making uh, thumbnails for um, illustrations uh, and concept art too. Um, just to try and stop myself from getting too much into details. Watercolour is uh, difficult to use and also at that size um, it really stops you from being fussy and it makes you think so much more about shape and composition. Um, and also the sort of really basic necessities of light and dark in your uh, in your image. Um, I found it to be really successful for me, and uh, it stops me from from getting too precious with an image before uh, before I get started. So what I've done here in uh, Photoshop, I'm using CS4 by the way, um, is create. Um, a, I've certainly uh, increased the size of the the image um, to the size I'm going to work at. I think it's about 14 inches across, and I've added a reduced opacity layer filled with white. Uh, just to knock the uh, watercolour painting back so I can draw on top of it and see what's going on underneath. Um, you can probably see already from uh, what I've drawn on top that um, I never really stick verbatim to the um, layout of the watercolour painting underneath. It's there to help establish the composition, but it's so limited in terms of detail that inevitably the drawing is going to have to be slightly different from the painting underneath. Um, so what I'm doing here is I'm using the third diver um, to um, of move them around so that the um, viewer has more of an idea of scale when they look at the image. I've got three divers, um, all at different sizes, um, and they're recognizable, obviously human uh, shape, uh, so that they give the viewer some idea of uh, what the uh, what the scale of the image is. Um, so the fish I just drew in there, I'm going to paint those out and probably paint them in using a uh, a speed brush later, but we'll, we'll get to that later on. And so what I'm doing here is trying to differentiate the scale of the first and second diver a little bit more um, so that it really helps kind of give uh, some depth to the image. Um, I'm also refining the narrative as I go, and so I'm having the third diver here swim away from the creature um, behind him at this point. Um, I always have an idea of the narrative in mind uh, before I get going, uh, but it, it usually gets kind of um, refined as I go along. So I've made another semi-opaque layer filled with white just to knock back the drawing and the watercolour painting a little bit further and I'm making a slightly more refined uh, line drawing over top. It's a very, very simple brush. It's a custom brush but very, very straightforward. Um, and I'm just laying in some details with, uh, with line and uh, deciding what these divers are going to look like, what kind of equipment they have and uh, trying to use their pose to articulate the, the narrative of the image. And so this diver can obviously see what's happening in the background. And his pose, it's not desperately strong, but it's supposed to articulate some kind of idea of surprise or that he's beginning to move backwards or he's thinking about moving backwards because he'd like to get away from this huge leviathan that he can see rising up in the background. Um, similarly, uh, these um, pillars of, of uh, coral or undersea rock, um, I'm not putting in huge amounts of detail, but this is just to kind of help uh, establish you know, what's what in the scene and how it all relates to one another. Um, the pillars also are uh, a, a, an indicator of scale. Um, they're not as predictable as, say, a person uh, in terms of their size, so they're not as helpful um, in communicating scale to the viewer as the human figures are. But given that the details on them is roughly the same scale relative to their size, hopefully it gives uh, more of an idea of depth uh, to the image. So I've changed the pose of the, the second diver um, still is desperately strong, but I guess she's kind of resting her hand on the middle pillar uh, with this hesitant kind of uh, pose because uh, she also can see what's, uh, what's going on in the background. So when I made the watercolour image, I knew I wanted a really big recognisable object to be right next to the uh, monster in the background so that at first glance the viewer could see exactly how big this thing is. And so that's why it has a nuclear submarine stuck in between its teeth. Um, that's a really ubiquitous image in popular culture. People understand how big that is just by looking at it. And so by sticking it in between the creature's teeth, it gives you an immediate idea of how big this thing is. 
So I'm trying to strengthen the second, oh, sorry, the first diver's pose here a little bit. And um, you know, maybe he's signaling to his friends saying, holy crap, look what's behind you. Um, so I flip the canvas here, as you can probably tell. Um, flipping the canvas as you go, uh, whatever image that you're making, it's one of the great luxuries of working digitally. Um, I always used to do drawings with a, a mirror held up to it to try and flip it. Um, and this is a lot easier. Um, so I put a question mark over the guy's head and changed his pose um, because he's oblivious to what's going on behind him. But we'll get back to him later. Um, what I'm working on here now is a multiply layer. Uh, and I'm laying in a basic palette for the image. Um, it's under the water, so it's going to be predominantly blue and green. Um, using color doesn't come very naturally to me, so I do lean on what uh, Photoshop can do for you in terms of changing the hue and saturation um, and the relationship of colors after the fact using all of the amazing tools that Photoshop has. Um, but if you rely on that exclusively as a painter and as a, a designer, um, I think it makes you sort of lazy um, in terms of, of making decisions. And so even though it's not really my strength, what I'm trying to do here are pick image, uh, colors and tones that are going to help create the, the flavor or the mood, if you like, the, um, the, the, to um, the, uh, the, the, f yeah, the flavor, I guess, is the best word of the image. Um, and uh, also, uh, even though there isn't a huge tonal difference between the colors that I'm choosing here, there is enough that um, I'm starting to think about my concentration of lights and darks, where I'm putting my lightest and darkest um, tones on the screen and, and their relationship to one another. So for example, right now, the uh, submarine is the darkest part and the, uh, the teeth of the creature are very, very light. And having them next to one another probably isn't the optimal place to put the highest degree of contrast in the image. So I think that the submarine is going to get lighter as we go along. Um, I find it really hard to predict uh, the effects of uh, saturated colorful light on saturated colorful objects. Um, you know, reference is really invaluable for that, or even creating your own is even better. But I am trying to think about um, how a bright yellow wetsuit would appear uh, differently in a bluey green environment. Um, and so I've really tried to play down the, the yellow. Similarly for the orange and the purple, um, I've played down the saturation of those colors as well. I picked yellow, uh, orange, and purple simply because they provide contrast from the overall bluey green um, motif of the scene. Um, other than that, they're fairly arbitrary. I mean, I think the average wetsuit is probably black, uh, but that's really not going to help my image. Um, so I'm using I'm using color instead. I think it's uh, probably more effective in terms of having the, the diver stand out. So one of the advantages in working in solid color, as you can see there, I was using the um, the paint bucket tool to drop in some different colors, uh, just to try and strengthen the, the relationship in terms of tones. And you can see that, yes, the submarine did get a lot lighter relative to the rest of the scene. Um, after a little bit of playing with the, uh, the hue and saturation of the image, uh, what I'm working on now is another multiply layer with um, a large airbrush. And I'm just knocking in areas of light and shade just to imply that we're close to the surface of the water here and that there's shafts of sunlight penetrating the surface of the water and falling on this creature's face. Um, that does two things. It tells you where this is happening relative to the surface. Not that that's desperately important, but it might be interesting to the viewer. Um, but the other thing that it does is it helps break up the, the sheer amount of real estate that the monster's face is occupying in the image. When I was thinking and conceiving of, of what the image was going to look like, I wanted the, the uh, face of the creature, or whatever I was going to show of the creature, to be very large relative to the field of view. The more of a, an object that you have kind of um, occluded by the edges of the, the image, um, the bigger it feels. Um, and so uh, that's why it's filling up a, a large portion of the canvas. But we don't want that to, to become boring. Uh, so what I'm doing here is I'm selecting uh, the foreground elements uh, in my multiply layer by uh, selecting the colors. And um, I've used them to make a quick mask so that I can differentiate between working on the background and the foreground. Um, if you don't use masks in um, the layer palette in Photoshop, I highly recommend it. It's sort of a digital equivalent to masking fluid that you can apply before or after you make the image. It really is a very, very powerful tool. Um, so what I did there was I selected the, um, the blue shadows that I painted onto the creature's face. And then I inverse that selection 
made a soft light layer and filled it with kind of a greeny yellow. Um, and then that way I increased the amount of contrast between shadow and light that's falling on this thing's, uh, this thing's face. Um, so now what I've done is I've made just a, a regular flat uh, normal layer. Um, and I'm selecting color that's already there in the image. Um, and just trying to further define the differences between areas that are in shadow and in light on the creature's face and pay particular attention to the, um, the quality of this eyeball. Um, it's sort of one of the focal points of the image, I think. Um, if you look at where the arms of the middle diver are, um, they're kind of pointing, or at least one of the arms is pointing to the, uh, the eye. And similarly, um, the right arm of the foreground diver is also pointing vaguely in the direction of the eye. And so there's a few lines and sort of leaders. Um, the nostril uh, of the uh, creature that's close to its eyeball is also pointing to it. So we've got a few things that are kind of drawing the, the eye's attention to the eyeball. So uh, it's worth spending a bit of time, I think, on sort of making that look good because it's one of the focal points of the image. So you can see here I'm using the eyedropper tool and a paintbrush. It's a really simple uh, brush just to kind of noodle away and um, uh, you know, add some subtlety. Uh, I've got the brush's opacity set to about 35%, I think. Um, and that just helps soften my, uh, my brush strokes and make them disappear into the image a little bit so that uh, um, you don't get these big blobby shapes um, happening in this, um, this very large uh, creature which is very, very far away from you, the viewer. And so any stroke that I make on this face, I'm trying to make it smaller and more subtle. So it just kind of blends into the larger picture. It doesn't really call attention to itself and doesn't really show you kind of um, you know, the size of, of, of this thing in, in the wrong way. Um, so I flipped my image there um, just to um, have a look what was, uh, what was wrong with it. Um, and at this stage, there's, there's plenty. It needs a lot of work. Um, and I've changed the position of the, um, the third diver to give him this kind of What's, what's your guys' problem sort of uh, pose, and that's why there's a question mark over his head. I'll delete that in a minute. Um, and so I think I've set my narrative now for the scene. You've got your third diver who's completely oblivious to this creature behind him, and then you've got his mates who are floating in front of him and who are trying to attract his attention to the fact that here is this submarine munching monstrosity uh, looming up behind him. Uh, so I'm still working in flat color here, um, a, a reduced opacity uh, for the brush. Um, and just trying to um, further kind of strengthen the, uh, the light and shade uh, in the face. And here I was thinking that the, the light would probably be shining into and then through um, the eyeball. I, I, think, I think that might be known as subsurface scattering, I'm not really sure. Um, but anyway, I, I want the, uh, the eyeball to retain a certain degree of translucency that the skin doesn't have. And so it's important for light to travel through it and kind of illuminate it um, from below. Um, and so uh, that's what I'm trying to do here is kind of tidy up the eyeball um, and really differentiate it texture-wise from the skin that's happening around it. Um, and uh, so I'm still working in flat color um, at a slightly reduced uh, opacity. And yeah, um, what that green glow at the bottom of the eyeball is supposed to be is, is light traveling through the top of the eye and illuminating the bottom of the eye relative to the, the view. And, um, now I'm going to use a multiplier layer just to add some detail back into the eyeball um, so that it still reads as an, as an eye. Um, but using multiply, I still get to keep um, that detail that I've established now in the background of the, the eye passing through uh, the eyeball. Um, and so uh, more multiply, uh, just trying to darken up the sides of it to, uh, to really show off that, that passage of light through the eye. Also, kind of sharpen up the edges and, and um, really make it pop out of the uh, the eye socket in the face. Because, like I was saying before, it's it's kind of the focal point of the image. Um, so I think I've got far enough with the overall with the, the background. Uh, I'm going to leave it as it is for now, just because um, I need to get on with this painting. You can see I've used a really quick spatter brush to kind of put some flotsam in in the background, and I kept it really really small. It should read more as a texture. Than sort of individual pieces. And so on a new layer here, I'm making a fish shape um, using just a really simple brush and some black. And um, using this fish shape, I'm going to make myself a custom brush. So now I have a nice fish brush. 
and uh, I'm going to change my uh, brush settings to make this fish a bit more useful. Um, I'm going to play around with the scattering, um, the shape dynamics, just to try and make it so that when I make a, a brush stroke with this fish brush, it feels a bit more natural and a bit less procedural. Um, so I'm even using color dynamics as well to uh, get some lighter and darker fish uh, in this shoal. Um, and so uh, trying to keep my fish shapes really, really small, um, I'm populating my midground um, with kind of a, a wall of fish, if you like, to further separate the creature in the background from the divers uh, in the foreground. But what's really going to be important is later on you'll see I'll make a, a layer of fish that are in front of and around the divers so that it helps kind of establish that scale, uh, but it also means that the backgrounds and foregrounds are married together. Um, the other advantage of, of painting the fish in this way, in this kind of layer, is it helps, up, again, to kind of break up the monotony of the, the creature's face in the background. So uh, that layer you, you just saw pop up there was uh, my reference layer. I usually have a layer like that in most uh, paintings as I go, um, and it's reference material that I've collated either from my own photographs or from the internet, um, and basically just helps me um, inject some realism into the, uh, the image. Um, you know, I find references really, really invaluable. Um, it just it adds so much to what you make as, a, as an artist. Um, I, I find I use it for almost everything if I, if I can. Um, and so uh, it's just good to have there in your image so you can toggle it off and on and, uh, and take a good look at it. So um, the background is, you know, it's fairly advanced and so I'm addressing the midground now and uh, I'm trying to uh, populate these um, undersea pillars with a bit of detail. Basically, they're a mixture of, they're, I guess they're a rock structure that has coral uh, growing on top of it. Right now, they don't have a whole lot of detail. I'm just trying to make the shapes a little bit more appealing to the eye um, and um, kind of give you the idea of maybe what they're, they're made from. Um, and so uh, I'm using a multiply layer. Um, I'm also using my uh, quick mask as a selection um, so that I can just dump in these shapes to kind of flesh out what this thing is and then also to establish for example here the relationship between the diver in the foreground and the pillar behind him. Um, he's close to it so his shadow is being cast onto the pillar. Um, that kind of um, interaction between objects is really important just to make them feel like they are together in the scene um, and then you just kind of link them uh, by using light being cast on one and then shadows falling onto the other. Um, and uh, this is just a really quick and dirty way of making something look a little bit um, better is uh, another multiply layer um, and just using a gradient tool um, to add some uh, tonal variety to uh, these pillars. What that also does as well, as you can see, I've got a concentration of really dark um, shapes towards the bottom of the image. And so it darkens the bottom of my um, pillars and it reduces the contrast towards the bottom of the pillars. So your eye is going to be drawn down there a lot less now because there's less contrast to look at. Um, and I'm kind of blending those dark shapes together to give the image some cohesion. Um, well, you saw my uh, reference material again there for a second. Um, and uh, what I'm doing now is I'm painting in straight color uh, onto these pillars. Um, and I'm using colors that I'm selecting from mostly from the background so that I'm working within the same palette. Um, but I'm trying to hint at the idea that there's some kind of uh, coral or, or sea life growing on these uh, these pillars, and so they aren't just lumps of igneous rock or something like that. They they do have some kind of life to them. I mean, one of the amazing things about the the sea, particularly where people go um, scuba diving, is that I mean it's just literally teeming with life. Um, and so I'm trying to kind of give the image that that feeling that you know you're surrounded by. Life as you're, you're swimming around down here. Um, I didn't notice when I did it actually, I missed it, but I think I've, uh, I've duplicated my mid ground fish, um, reduced the opacity of the, the layer, and uh, used a blur filter on it just to kind of give them that um, slight glow, I guess. Um, the idea being that the light that's being reflected from them is diffused slightly by the water, and so it gives everything a, a softness um, the further it gets away from the viewer. So if you have these really crisp pieces of information that are far away, it's going to be confusing to the eye. So softening them 
really helps kind of establish it a bit further away. Um, painting in more details here on the rock. Um, that really helps the, um, the level of contrast there, or that bit that I just kind of tweaked. It helps it stand out from the, the submarine behind it, which is much more muted in its relationship between lights and darks. It's still very contrasty, but it's not nearly as contrasty as the pillar in front of it. Um, and so it really helps kind of create space in between the two of them, even though they are overlapping one another in the, uh, the composition. Um, similarly, I'm dumping some more contrast here onto uh, the, the faces of these pillars that would uh, be receiving light from the, the surface. And what that helps do is kind of solidify my lighting scheme. Uh, one pillar is casting a shadow on the other, and it makes the two um, kind of live together a little bit more effectively in the, the composition. Um, so I'm kind of getting to the point now where the pillars, I think, are about as good as they're going to get. So I'm turning my attention to the uh, divers, which I've more or less ignored um, throughout the, the duration of this painting. Um, this is a multiply layer. Um, I'm just putting some local color, um, kind of a, a bluey green, um, but a very desaturated one, uh, over top of the, the yellow um, wetsuit, just to add in some shadows. And then I'm doing something similar here with the middle diver. Um, and then also trying to add some volume to the head and hands. Um, but for anyone who's swum uh, in the sea or in a pool, usually when you look at your own skin underwater, it seems shockingly white, uh, if you're Caucasian, that is, um, uh, which these characters uh, look as if they are. Um, and so I've tried to keep their skin tone um, sort of whiter than um, it would be if you saw them out on the street. Um, so I'm making it consistent with what happens when, when you go for a swim. Um, and uh, what I'm doing here really is just trying to make the figure read as kind of a, a solid object within the context of the, the image that we're making um, and applying the lighting scheme to it, having his arm cast a shadow on his body and on his leg and having one leg cast a shadow on the other. And that way it just makes the, the figure just seem a little bit more fleshed out and realistic. Um, I'm pretty sure I've nicked the color scheme of this wetsuit from maybe a Bruce Lee film or something like that, or maybe it's Kill Bill, I'm not sure. Um, but the black on yellow, uh, it's a nice um, it's a nice familiar sort of aesthetic, and I've used it for this one here. Um, yeah, it's an airbrush tool there, just trying to um, find a really quick way to put some shadow onto uh, the uh, air tank uh, strapped to his back. Obviously it's a cylindrical object, and so the shadows on it are going to be pretty soft. So um, uh, an airbrush is, is great for achieving that. This is more multiply uh, layers here, and I'm layering in some some details. He needs to have a, a buoyancy jacket on, and a regulator, and a, a weight belt, and so on and so forth. Um, I don't know a lot about diving, um, even though my brother manufactures scuba diving uh, clothing for a living, bizarrely enough. Um, but I'm referring to one of my photographs from the internet uh, of where to um, put the. Uh, the equipment on the diver's body and what the equipment looks like, more or less. Um, I'm not really going into a great degree of detail because, quite frankly, the diving equipment isn't the focal point of the image. If I can put in enough information that it sells itself as being recognisable or realistic, um, it's good enough for what I'm trying to achieve here, which is to make a, a cost-effective image. I'm trying to make it fairly quickly. Um, if somebody from Paddy, for example, or some other diving uh, body took a look at this image, I'm sure they'd have a good laugh at how I've portrayed the divers, but um, anyway, it's, um, it's good enough for me. Um, so uh, here I'm just trying to add some more details to the, uh, the middle diver and make her hands work a little bit big, uh, a little bit better. I keep making them too big, um, and then they appear sort of like baseball mitts or man's hands, so uh, I've played with the, the scale of the hands quite a bit. Uh, I've tried to give some movement to her hair so that it makes it look as if she's underwater and her hair is kind of moving around uh, as she bobs up and down. Uh, and I'm giving her a bit more equipment um, and uh, detail to her uh, oxygen tank. And now we're going to uh, address the third diver, who right now looks really funky. Um, so I'm changing the shape of his arms and hands to uh, try and make them fit together a bit more anatomically uh, with the rest of the, the image. Um, and I've made his face very, very bright there so that um, it's high contrast and it reads well against the, the darker uh, face in the background. 
although I've just gone and obscured the, the face with a, a mask. Um, I've got some uh, really saturated blue light uh, reflecting on his mask also uh, on top of his face, which um, it's a nice kind of trick just to show that there's light falling on his face. So uh, here's my reference uh, layer again, and I've got a picture of a, uh, a submarine. Obviously I've taken some liberties with the, uh, the shape of the sub, but I think it's close enough that people are going to recognize what it is. And so uh, using a multiply layer, I'm just dumping some detail into the, uh, the sub just to try and make it a little bit more believable because uh, right now it's one of the weaker parts of the image. Um, uh, although it really is kind of performing a function um, in the image in that it's helping, like I said before, to establish scale. So it's worth giving it some attention uh, at this, even at this late stage. Um, so I'm just putting in really simple shapes and lines just to try and give it enough detail uh, to read, but I don't want to put too much detail in, otherwise it's going to get in the way. Uh, so I'm using a, a, a brush here, a spatter brush, to make some bubbles. Um, and uh, I think originally I made them really, really white, but they just seemed a bit artificial. So I've put some uh, some more kind of light, but a very saturated but light, tonally light blue in there, just so that they feel a little bit less artificial. Uh, and I'm letting the bubbles go over the top of the... Um, the diver's face there, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to mask, uh, mask them out um, just to reveal his, his mask and face, but I want to make sure that the bubbles look as if they're behind his head. So all the divers, divers have got bubbles now, uh, it's another kind of cue for scale. You can see how the bubbles are bigger in the foreground, smaller in the background. And now I'm getting back to my fish, and I've got my uh, fish brush again, uh, and I'm dumping some fish now into the foreground just to try and establish um, the relationship between the fish in the midground and fish in the foreground so that we marry those two spaces together um, and they do look as if they belong to the same the same scene. So um, I'm more or less letting the scattering of the brush put the fish uh, where they are in the image. I'm not worried too much about where they're going to go. You can see that there's one that's landed on the back of the guy's um, uh, air tank in the foreground uh, and it's in a really awkward place. It's not going to stay there. Uh, I'm going to erase it after the fact, but I'll get around to that eventually. Um, so what I'm doing here is I'm just playing with the uh, the saturation and the lightness and darkness of, uh, of the fish, just to try and get them to play well with the rest of the image and not stand out too much. Uh, and here I'm using the dodge tool just to have shafts of light hitting some of the fish so that we get some more variety um, in terms of tone uh, of these fish so that they don't look quite so monosyllabic, I guess. So I'm just mucking about here with different layer effects to kind of bring all of the colors together. Like I said at the beginning, I do try and work in uh, the colors that are intended to go into the palette, but given that I'm not the world's greatest painter, um, I'm more at home with pencils and paper, quite frankly, um, I do often use the, the kind of the power that Photoshop gives you to help um, bring all of your colors together. And then uh, what I'm doing here is um, I'm just using the gradient tool and an airbrush uh, tool uh, in multiply layers um, to uh, try and give some softness to the, the image and try and uh, get rid of some of the hard edges and just make it seem much more like it's, it's underwater. So um, I did flip the composition uh, about halfway through working on it and I've decided to leave it flipped because um, I think it works better this way. Um, if you've never used the variations uh, tool in Photoshop, this is what it looks like. Uh, it's under image uh, adjustments um, in the uh, drop down menus and it's absolutely invaluable for kind of setting your color scheme um, towards the end of an image. Um, it, it really is very, very powerful. It's really come in handy here. Um, and so, um, yeah, that's, uh, that's almost done. So thank you very much for watching and uh, hopefully you enjoyed it. Cheers for now.